Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. This is Chelsea Alders. This week, we chatted with Dr. Dave Jenkins, creator and founder of Surfade. If you don't know much about this organization, this interview will give you a much clearer perspective on what they're doing to make drastic changes in isolated island regions around the world. We've been giving back to this organization for 10 years now, but this is the very first time we actually got to hear Dave's story from his very first surf trip in the Menaway Islands 18 years ago. Dr. Dave flips our perspective on how we can best approach smaller villages and communities that are deeply rooted in their traditions. He gives us such a strong understanding of why it may not be effective coming in and teaching change, but instead implementing change within their own community through their own community leaders. Currently, Dave is also a part of the Ending Alzheimer's Fight in Australia, working alongside Dr. Dale Bredesen to develop new programs to prevent and cure Alzheimer's. So, as you can tell, we are going in some seriously cool directions in this interview. We get to chat birth and babies and fasting and health with a man who is just oh so much more qualified to be discussing such topics than us. I hope you can learn a bit in this one and get inspired to take steps forward on your own mission, whatever that may be. Greetings, everyone. This is Jay Alders and a couple of quick pertinent little tidbits before we get into the episode with Dave. So while you're listening, it would be a great time to go to surfaid.org or go to social media and look up Surfaid. You can make a donation. You could see what they're up to. You could join their newsletter. They are such a great, great cause doing amazing things for humanity. Also, I would love for your support and your eyeballs to peep onto my artwork so you can see what I'm up to. Uh, if you check out jalders.com, you could find my artwork and see about all the things that I'm involved in, one of which is being an ambassador to SurfAid. And on social media, you could find me at jalders as well. Chelsea is a birth doula, and you can find her at Instagram at Chelsea Alders or Omama's Doulas or Omama's Doulas.com. And if you haven't done so yet, I invite you to please click subscribe on whatever podcast player you are currently listening to. That being said, let's jump into this. I love your art, and thank you, by the way, for you know the things you've done for us over the years. Oh, man, it's it's my honor. Uh, I've been proud to be an ambassador to SurfAid um, since 2008. I'm so thrilled to have the chance to talk to you because it's such a worthy. Um, cause you guys are doing such great work. I'm happy for the, like the little blip on the radar that I'm able to contribute, and I'm really excited to be able to enter this conversation and share some of the story and the mission. So, so thank you for that, Dave. No, you're welcome. We're uh, you know it's been 19 years, but we're still very passionate about what we do. Yeah, I, I guess that's a great place to start. Like 19 years, holy smoke! So. I, I know probably more than most listeners what SurfAid is about and what you guys are doing, but I really want to educate and raise awareness for what you are doing. So can you tell us a bit about, uh, you have such a great story. I know you've told it 4,000 times. Can you share with us again <laughs> the story on how SurfAid started and we'll take it from there? Yeah. So uh, I was in Singapore um, 19, whatever it was, 19 years ago. <laughs> And uh, I was a corporate doc running a very big uh, medical program and um, saving money to sail the world. That was my dream. And I uh, went surfing. I just took a break to go surfing to the Mentawai and, you know, see the Disneyland of surfing. I was actually at uh, Lance's Ride or HT's and we had some beautiful waves in the morning and I, we were anchored up in the keyhole there. I just noticed that there were kids running around on the beach because you couldn't really see anything. It was just paradise and palms. And I thought, oh, there must be a village there. So I, I asked the guy to take me in. And we had to go like a kilometer or a mile down the beach because the swell was just hitting the shore. We could, couldn't have landed the, the small runaround. And so we had to walk back to the village. And as I was walking back, just before we hit the village, we came upon the graveyard right there like literally two feet from the little track and i just looked at it and noticed there were uh not a, a, a quite a large number of small very small graves and so i sort of well wow okay so it looks like paradise but clearly it's not for the children 
Um, and so I, I went into the village and I had an uh, Indonesian guy with me and he was translating for me. And I started asking a whole lot of questions. And then with about five minutes, uh, somehow, I don't know how, the chief found out I was a doctor asking questions in town and came up to me and said, hey, you're the first doctor to ever come to this village. Oh my God. And uh, we've got a bunch of sick people. Would you mind seeing them? So I said, yeah, okay. Not, I thought I'd see sort of five or six people with the most. So the the weird thing is when you're a doctor and you go with a bunch of mates surfing, they expect you to be able to perform minor neurosurgery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you and were what so kind we, of a doctor? Yeah, like, what, what was your was, specialty at this point? Well, I, I was actually uh, into education. So I was running a big medical education program. Um, I kind of left my practice and became an academic. Uh, for a while, so uh, I worked for the university, and then, and then I got this job as a corporate uh, guy, training a whole bunch of doctors around Asia. Okay. And uh, can I ask why I, you left your practice? Like, why, what um, made you switch over? Um, yeah, I'm kind of a. Um, I was interested in the, in the development of of medicine. Okay. And I wanted to make a contribution because I could see that there were a lot of glaring gaps and the quality and what we could provide, what, what we needed to provide and uh, what was being provided. And so I uh, got an opportunity to join the academic team who were looking at these issues. And then we started training uh, GPs in New Zealand with the more advanced evidence-based protocols. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it was a time of great change and we were kind of leading that change. So it was kind of exciting. But, um, and then this corporate uh, noticed our work and asked me to come and join them and um, you know I was trying to su- trying to buy a catamaran so the money was just too bad <laughs> too, too much yeah, to uh, no, it was another adventure and so yeah so I just started uh, doing educational medicine really um, teaching okay and um, and so yeah so I, I but I still retained this large medical bag because I knew I'd want to go on a surfing trip sooner or later and uh, with all the all the stuff that I needed in to do minor neurosurgery, was that for was that for like you and your mates in case you got messed up yeah. while you were surfing, more okay. or less? Yeah, 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 exactly. As you know, uh, you know, I go to way off places, and um, you get a fracture of a you know fibula or a head injury, you're in really big trouble. So I guess everyone that goes with you is pretty lucky, but you're kind of screwed. If you're the guy. <laughs> I, I have heard of uh, doctors who've had to sew their face up in the mirror. Oh, get out of it. No, are you serious? No oh, yeah, yeah. No, I actually worked with a guy who was in the old Rhodesian War as a as a sixth-year medical, like an intern. He was the last year, and he, he put 50 stitches into his face because a bomb went off near oh, him. Oh, my God. Um, and he showed me all the scars, and he was he was actually training to be a neurosurgeon. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, that was quite a tall story. But anyway, I bought the bag back an hour later, and there was like 200 people sitting there waiting for this, you know, first doctor ever to come. And really, we we kind of sweated out in this dirty old little hut. Um, And it's really, we all know what this thing goes on, but when you get exposed after, uh, you know, after a morning of just play and beautiful food and a bintang and, um, the, the contrast to what was happening to our hosts um, was quite glaring. You know, there were just yeah. children being wasting away. And when I had a good look at them, they were anemic. And when I started asking stories, asking questions, they, it was clear they were getting recurrent um, bouts of both malaria and diarrhea. And they spent a lot of their life just lying around uh, battling one infection after the other and, and uh, often succumbed and would end up in the graveyard I passed. And, um, and there was tuberculosis and, and, the, and malnutrition, which struck me because this is, a, you know, it's very fertile, um, lots of rain, they can grow a lot of things. So it was just clear that behaviours, there were a few behaviours that were I could I sort of sat down and figured out. Well, if you if you gave them a mosquito net, if they used, so they were all using soap, but they weren't using it at the right time. They didn't have toilet. They uh, were giving the wild spinach that grew to their pigs, but not to their children. Oh my god! Um, 
you know, just so I thought, I, I, I worked through about seven or eight behaviors if we had a mosquito net for them that would radically change, theoretically, radically change um, from the biology of the situation, the, the situation. So I remember we, um, even my kind of brutal surf mates were, went pale, some had to leave from the, the clinic and, and we were all very kind of sober and sat around very quiet that night having just been exposed to something quite extreme. Dave, and, uh, Dave can I stop you yeah. for one second? Because what's going yeah. through my head is like, obviously there's the emotional aspect of what you're going through and there's the aspect of like hey i'm a doctor i have some responsibility professionally and morally but then does the other part of it get in your head at that point like i've also been exposed to malaria or these other infectious diseases does that as a doctor does that enter your consciousness or do you not think about that i didn't think about that at all um in fact (laughs) I'm only just thinking about it now because I'm still recovering <laughs> from, uh, um, you know, I got a really nasty parasite out uh, there and it's really messed with my gut. So um, I ha- I'm still having issues with that. But anyway, I'm, I'm kind of 70% there now. So having... 19 years later and this is the first thing that's affected you? That's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I am surpri- I was surprised I didn't catch malaria. I really was because I was, uh, you know, living out there in the villages. But we just did the basic disciplines and um, put long sleeve shirts on. I remember my, my corporate shirt <laughs> turned out to be useful in malaria protection shirt. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, so we, we actually stood out. When we were examining uh, the biting behavior of the malaria mosquito out there, we actually, four of us, uh, parked ourselves through the night on the edges of the village and got deliberately got bitten with someone with a flashlight in a pipette. Um, and they would suck up, they would see the mosquito biting us and they would suck it up in a pipette and then they'd take it to the central micro, uh, microscopist who was analyzing the mosquitoes. Oh so God. we worked out. Um, we brought in the, you know, a, um, a specialist who was looking at the. We worked out that the peak biting time of the Mentawai malaria mosquito is around eleven or twelve o'clock at night, and mm. so, be, you know, because sometimes it's not. Sometimes it can be six or. So we we knew then if we could get everyone under a mosquito net we would have a radical reduction in malaria in those islands. Well, so rewind. So we've got you just leaving a surf session and, and you're walking into this village. So then when, you, I mean, I imagine you had to leave, restart and come back. So when did it become something that you're like, I'm coming back here and setting up shop? Well, I had an internal battle, you know, you know, what about my dream kind of thing? Um, I bet. And I had all sorts of voices in my head. And the, the one that really <laughs> turned me was my ex-wife who, who once said to me, you know, there's three types of people in the world today. The one that make it a better place, the one that do nothing, and you, David, a psychopath. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man. <laughs> She's not bitter at all, huh? No, no, believe it or not, we're actually still good friends. <laughs> Some things need to be said, right? That's all. Yeah, I probably deserved it. Um, but I sat down and thought, you know what? I am a bit of a what I'd call an armchair humanitarian and that I wanted the world to be a better place. I'd always done what, my best for my patients, but... Um, when it came to the bigger picture, I was on a marathon chasing down my dream. And, you know, it was a wholesome dream to sail the world. Well, and I think that's relatable, though. That's most, I mean, that's most people. Like, there's not going to be, you know, every person isn't going to be the person that, that even left the wave to, like, walk out there. So it's not a rare thing to be, like, set your priorities as those dreams, you know? No, it's not. Um, and I just saw that just there were a couple of images of the kids, I could still see them now in my head, that just stuck with me, almost as if they were talking to me. Yeah. And, um, and so I just, I just couldn't, and I was with my fiancé at the time, and I said, you know, honey, what about, uh, what if we, about we gave all this up and did something about that? Do you think we'd have a good shot? And she's a very, uh, she's a very talented, um, from a point of view of administrative 
Um, I lack managerial skills. Okay. Um, and uh, and um, she said, yeah, I'm on for it. So we decided to fly back home and give things up. And then I asked a couple of friends. One was a scientist and one was a lawyer. Uh, again, I, if I do this thing, will you support me? And, and they said, yes. So I sort of realized, wow, okay, the duckies are all lining up. So, um, okay, let's do it. So I had to sort of sell my house and buckle down and um, get going. Wow. So then where did you officially move closer to that region at that point? Yeah, look, it took, it took uh, 18 months okay. to, um, to really, I mean, to, you know, do, to start a nonprofit, to do it all right, to I uh, toured Australia and tried to meet with all the heads of the surf industry. And I was just a doctor with a crazy idea. So looking back at them, I don't kind of, you know, that was very, very challenging. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, but also 18 but, months is pretty quick in the scheme of things. Like it seemed like forever then, I'm sure. But really, yeah, to pull yeah, that all together. Well, well, yeah, we, <laughs> it seemed like a real slow grind at the time. Um, but we, we eventually got an appointment with a, a founder of a travel guide company. And she listened to the story and she just said, um, it was the shortest, most effective interview I've ever had. <laughs> She was a wonderful human being. She just said, good on you. I'm going to write you a check. And she wrote us a check for, um, I think it was 25 grand back Whoa. then. And um, we, at that point, we said, okay, we're out of here. We're going to go and live in the villages and make a start. And, uh, and that's what we did. So if we're ever going to get this thing started, even if we spend that 25 grand, we're just going to have to jump, get out there. And we, we ran our first malaria program. Okay, so talk about that first malaria program. So what did that look like from the ground up? Like, what is that even, I know you have to set up shop there, but what does that look like trying to implement that and rework that education into uh, villages, like the way that they're already living? So um, we, first of all, the only, we, yeah, it, it, was, it was kind of looking back at it, it was extremely stupid. <laughs> um, in that, in that, you know, look, I, technically I was good. I knew all the thing about malaria. I knew, and we actually had to battle with customs. We were the first people to get in the new long lasting insecticide net. So now back then, like 20 years ago, you'd have to re-soak the nets every six months okay. um, in, in insecticide. And, and that really turned, you know, villages off and, and it just became a real headache. But we were the first to bring in these nets that had been soaked in insecticide, and they last five years. Whoa, okay. But um, it was my first sobering expe experience with customs because we had to bring them in from Vietnam, and um, they wanted to slap this huge tax on them. And, uh, you know, we're saying, hang on, this is for your people. We're going to give these away. How can you do that? Yeah. So th the nets got held up, but we got a small... And, and looking back, that was a really good thing because we got a small amount through and we went out there, we stood in front of the villagers after their church service and lectured them in very bad, very bad Indonesian um, and then handed out these nets. Well, a week later, I went swimming and found they were being used as fishing nets. Oh, my God. So, wow. so, um, <laughs> so the, good news, the good news was that I realized we hadn't, didn't really have a clue about what it was the good community bottom up development, you know. Right. So I'm still kind of wondering, like, was there a moment when you were seeing these people suffering and dying and walking past the cemetery of children? Was there a moment that you remember, an exact moment where you realized, like, shit, I can't unsee, I can't unknow this. I actually have to get involved. And did you know what that looked like? Like, I can't imagine envisioning what surf aid is now like i guess what was your vision and when did it when was it born when did it happen well you know when i when i was i, I came back from that experience and i was just you know, tossing and turning and i looked at the um the science the latest science of these new mosquito nets that you could get you know 50 60 percent reductions in malaria just by getting people under these nets or even more and especially in the children and uh 
So that was really optimistic. So I thought, well, logistically, if we, we could get them under the net, we could actually have a real impact and very cost effectively. You know, a family of four under a net for five years for $10. Yeah. Um, and so that really buoyed me and sort of thought, okay, this, this is possible. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I thought. So we, that's why we started with uh, malaria, just that was kind of the low hanging fruit. Okay. Um, and the people, and we did talk to the people about, they identified malaria. They didn't really know what it was, but they, you know, the, the, the recurrent fevers, sweats, shakes, and then recover or die kind of thing. That was just, there's always someone in the village with that. And so right. they knew the, the syndrome, but they didn't know um, what it was called. Some, some thought it was coconut juice or evil forest spirit. Oh, my gosh. Um, and so we, even though it was a failure, our first tiny little um, rollout, it taught us a key thing. So instead of lecturing them, we got together, we, we sort of moved in, lived in the villages for weeks. And I can tell some stories about, about crabs calling in our ears at night time. Oh, and all oh my God, dude. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> but, uh, that might have done me in. We listened, we listened to them rather than, than lecturing them. We asked them, what would it take, after explaining what malaria is, in your culture, what would really what would it take for your people to learn, understand, and practice using these nets? And they told us that they love plays, entertainment, amusement, and songs. So we worked with them and came up with a malaria play uh, where the chief was cross dressed as a pregnant woman, and they had <laughs> they had uh, they had masks with a big nose as a, a, a mosquito. And we did this play, and it went from like 5% of people using the net to 95% of the people using the net. Are you serious? Just speaking yeah. their, like, quote-unquote language, basically. That's amazing. Yeah. Let it, the key thing is you've got to let people control their destiny. You've got to, it's a very challenging thing to motivate and to guide and to nudge and support, which is what we do, and to provide technical knowledge. But at the end of the day, They've got to do it. You, you know, you yeah. don't help people by doing what they should and can do for themselves. You, you take their power away. Um, and so it's like the teach a man to fish, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's even yeah, it's even a little bit more than that. That's the kind of basic principle. But it's getting them to understand that their destiny, their quality of life improvement largely not totally but largely depends on them because when you're so poor and you've got a village that's got so much disease you know there's some big low-hanging fruit that will get you up uh, the ladder and the quality in, of life um, and so you've got to get them to understand that and we've done that i think that's one, one of the things i'm most proud of is so we've stuck with that core mission and and what happens <clears throat> right now we've got women coming to us and going, wow, wow, that was amazing. The health of our village is so much better. Now we want to deal with our poverty. We're really keen. So we're, we're helping them, you know, grow cash crops and that kind of thing. So you get this huge momentum, the snowball that just builds and builds and builds. So, yeah, so that was really, we took that malaria play to 199, some of the remotest villages on the planet, um, up and down those Mentawai chains. Dave, before we get much further, can you review and tell us what the what the mission of Surf Aid is, and maybe give us a quick synopsis on what you are trying to do with the organization, so people can kind of get a grasp as we unfold this story. They know what we're, uh, you know, what we're doing. So our mission is to improve the health and quality of life of people connected to us uh, through surfing. So it's, it's trying to, uh, well, it's successfully um, giving a giving back program. And we just knew that random acts of kindness, as good as they are, um, uh, we're not going to deal with the situation. And these are our hosts. So it's based on the philosophy of giving back. Um, you know, everyone knows what Indonesia has done for surfing. Yeah. Um, and, and we just have so many amazing experiences. And this is a, well, if I felt this way that it was wrong that our hosts, 50 meters from my luxury charter boat, are dying without us doing anything, then perhaps other people would. 
And that's turned out that that is the case, well, at least enough for us to grow and to build our program. Yeah, well, I think that mission that I mean, that mission has been it flows through you guys so clearly, like that was the one thing I remember just whenever we took part in your events, that was like the line that came out of us. And we didn't even know much about you and your mission back then. So it's yeah. been very clear. So I want to move forward and ask a little bit. So Dave, I'm actually a birth doula. And you know, there's a charitable side to the work that I do too. But I'm so fascinated with your mother and baby program. It's obviously something I'm incredibly passionate about. So can you talk a little bit about like the flaws you've seen? I know, like, the breastfeeding thing alone, I think about that in these third world countries all the time because let me tell you like we have all the resources in the world and I have women with extreme extreme issues and issues that are like they don't even know to get medical attention and we live in a place where that's readily available so talk a little bit about what you're seeing over there so um, after the malaria I mean we focused on the malaria because it was really big low hanging fruit and um, but after that we um, and we always wanted to do this. We just didn't have the resources, but uh, we got some more resources, and we developed what we call a mother-child program, and that was to deal with all of the low-hanging fruits. And so it became obvious to me as I lived in the villages, I would just learn and ask and observe that the woman was throwing out the colostrum. Oh my gosh! So um, they had they they developed. A belief, and I tried so hard. I talked to all the cultural leaders. I just tried to. Hide. Where did this belief come from? And, I, and no one could actually tell me. Really? Where, yeah. So um, it was such a strong belief. There were even these people, uh, women they called um, breastfeeding witches. They had a word. I mean, they had a word for witches, but it was meant by a good witch, okay. in that they understood. And these witches, and it's still going on in the tellos. Um, it doesn't go on now in the meantime because we've been there, but uh, they convinced everyone that the first milk, because of it's yellow and a bit different, is not good milk. It's bad milk. Um, and so they would not give babies anything uh, for, for 24 hours. Whoa. And, um, and, and so no one could come up with like the start of this belief that like colostrum is no, just poison? Oh, my no. God. No. That's so, so fascinating. Yeah. So we did a lot of work on the power of colostrum um, and exclusive breastfeeding. And that that's is a I mean you can if you get people in a village like that to give colostrum, you reduce infant mortality by about eighteen, twenty percent. And then oh. if you get them to do exclusive breastfeeding for six months, it's another fifteen, twenty percent. So boom. The colostrum and exclusive breastfeeding, you've radically, in a mosquito net, just right there, you've radically reduced infant mortality. Wow. So, um, yeah, so, and the other thing was their clean birthing. So I would kind of, you know, just, I think it's just relentlessly curious. I would ask them, there'd be a birth going on, and I'd uh, talk to the traditional midwife and say, well, what, you, what are you going to cut the cord with? And she'd bring this, I always remember, I've got a photo of it somewhere of her, her birthing kit. And it was this plastic, with nothing sterile, and all the kind of few instruments. And out of there, she pulled this piece of very sharp bamboo. And she cut the cord with that, completely unsterile, completely unclean. And uh, so no wonder some, many of the women were dying from uh, infection. Wow. And then were babies affected by that too, or it was just in the women? Yeah, well, the, your children get affected as well, but um, usually it's, it's the woman. Wow, uh, they get they get an, they can get an infection, but the babies as well they can get them. And uh, so, but but also they weren't washing the perineum. So there's another low hanging fruit. If you get a woman just to wash her perineum with warm soap and water before she goes as she's going through labour. Um, every three or four hours, uh, then you can have a 10 to 20% or even more reduction in uh, maternal mortality from, from childbirth. Wow. So you're setting up plans of just like three basic things we can change that can make these statistics like drastically different. Yeah. Just can't wait. And, and that's and what we realized because we were spending our own money at the beginning. We always wanted to be like kind of have a business approach to aid. 
It sounds weird, but we want to ask the question, how do we spend these dollars and get the maximum impact? And that kind of drove us because it turns out that's the best for the people and it's the best for our donors, of course. Yeah. So, um, and then, and then the, big, the big return is the exponential growth as those new behaviours percolate through the village and they, they literally see that the graveyard's no longer full of young graves. They teach their children and their sisters and, and you get generational change. Right. So um, that's, you know, then we're not spending any money and you've got a sustained improvement in, in quality of life. So do you guys have a structure in place now that's like when we need to implement like a new type of education, this is how we do it every time? Or are you just like with each new thing, you have to just decide what's best? There's a bit of both. There's a, that we do have it. We definitely have a model, but inside that model, because we always wanted to design a model for scale. Um, but inside that model, there's a, a thing we call um, barriers to behavior change segment where we train all our staff and we found that spending more time in the beginning doing the analysis leads to much more rapid change. Um, and so we all spend quite a lot of time, more than most aid organizations, uh, I'm sure of it because I know what they do. Uh, we will spend sometimes six months just uh, with our staff living in the villages, running these um, behavior analysis. So that would be things like, well, why are you throwing out the frostrum? What's, and what's the barrier for you doing exclusive breastfeeding? Well, Aeneas, the woman get up um, day two after childbirth and the men kick him out and tell go and go to the rubber plantations and tap the trees. <laughs> and so, um, so we had to address, and each culture has different, barriers to the healthy behaviors so that's how we work out how we're going to work with the people partner with them to address those barriers um yes yeah, so that's that's definitely part of our model wow that's so fascinating i just i mean i love it just because you see like on this basic structure that we just try to implement in you know our very wealthy countries and we even see broken pieces of these models so then when you see it in a place like that and you realize like education anywhere i mean it's just so fascinating to me because i feel like our we're really lacking in a lot of this education here too but it's nothing like there obviously well i think we we suffer we we, we do this top-down education and um you know knowledge is important but it's not change right um and so you've really got to focus on a model that is after change, lasting, long-lasting change. And, and you know, uh, I could tell you a hundred stories about other, other aid programs that have gone in that we've seen, you know, a poster goes up about malaria <laughs> or washing hands in the village. Yeah. And the people kind of look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's interesting. But there's no, there's no change that goes on. Right. I don't really know much about malaria, to be honest with you. So when you were working on it, uh, especially at the beginning, was were nets the primary way to correct the problem? Was there a medicinal aspect? Like if you if you did catch malaria, what would be the steps to to cure it with modern medicine? Right. So that was all changing too at the time. The nets, the prevention of malaria, is the big low hanging, cost effective uh, fruit. So. But we did work with the health department to improve. <clears throat> One of the, you can't just go in there as an aid organization and ignore the local institution. That that is an extreme mistake, and will not be. Uh, it'll be counterproductive for you. So we knew that we had to train, and they wanted to be trained. Um, what nurses and what few nurses and doctors were in the islands in the new therapies for malaria because there were a lot of uh, malaria resistance to the old drug um, and so that was part of our model but it wasn't the dominant factor because we knew spending uh, money on the net was a better return on investor okay. yeah yeah and you were so many people who just couldn't get to a doctor or nurse anyway um, and so it was never going to benefit them but we, we did do uh, health health department training. I'm I'm completely fascinated, Dave, by how you took your passion for surfing and traveling 
and somehow, for some reason, you believed, I would love to know how and why, you believed that you could create this organization from it, with, and you went at it with <laughs> such like fervor and such passion and, and belief. And, and from all I know from what you told me is that you were a doctor and you, you traded up for education and you were making great money. And then and your and ex-wife's <laughs> words were ringing in your brain. <laughs> and the next thing you know, like, oh, I'm selling my freaking house. So I'm going to go. Uh, I know you kind of do know. skip over it. Like, it's no big deal. But those are all like really life changing decisions. Like, yeah. Major. Like what I'm so what I'm hearing is that I think there's a lot of people listening, you know, myself included, who have passions and curiosities and you somehow found a way to to use your passion and your interests and your curiosities and your expertise to do something with it to kind of you know there's like that expression that like everything is kind of like selfish right so if we give to charity there's a level of it where we're giving to charity to make ourselves feel good there's like that whole skit from friends remember that one where there was like Ross was talk or someone was talking about how <laughs> everything is selfish and so you found a way to kind of uh satisfy you know, your uh, selfish desires to surf amazing waves while also helping the world. And I don't know why you thought that would be a reasonable thing to do. And like, I think there's, <laughs> there's people that probably would love to change the world, but they're like, I don't know how to do that. Like, why did you think you could do that, Dave? Well, I, I think you're right. I am unreasonable. <laughs> okay. um, Good answer. Uh, you know, and it's, that's just a personality trait. And, and many friends and family members have said to me, you're so unreasonable. Okay. Um, and yeah, it wasn't a logical choice. Um, and so I, I guess I did realize that I can be really dog headed and persistent. And um, once I decided something, it was all on, it's all or nothing. Yeah. And that was just a personality trait. And um, I, I actually lay this out in my TED talk. Um, it actually, the, the passion and persistence actually came to a head where it became counterproductive at one stage. Um, but it was what was required to get something started. And um, it's not what you need to build an organization. And so I've handed on those reins to people better qualified than me, and they're doing a wonderful job. So I, I don't really have a specific like answer for you other than um, I just knew in my heart of hearts at the end of the day that this was the right thing to do. Um, I knew it would be hard. I had no idea how hard it was going to be. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just thought, wow, well, it's kind of an adventure of the soul. Um you know, we all have our values and um, we all have things that, and our passions and, and uh, developing programs, whether it's my practice or teaching other doctors how to build their practice in a, in a good way that the quality of care, whatever, or, or surface, that's just the kind of sweet spot for me as a human being. Um, so it's kind of a social entrepreneurial um, approach to things. That, that, that you know that you grow something that ends up making life better for people so be, being a doctor and an educator i'm not going to let you off on this one so i really want to know how you can teach someone part of that mindset because if people can pick up a small percentage of your your stubbornness your you know your your pigheadedness as you were talking about <laughs> because a lot of people want to do stuff and they're like I don't know the first freaking thing about doing xyz is there some mindset or some dialogue in your head when most people would bail out that you're like yeah let's just keep going with it like how how can you teach some small percentage of that with a bullet pointed list or something uh well look i think you can it's about of course, at the end of the day, it depends on people's personalities and their situation and whether they're able to change. But, but change, uh, there are, it doesn't have to be that hard, but it has to be systematic. Okay. And um, so there's all sorts of really good books now on change. And one would be a book called Nudge. Um, so let's say you wanted to get fit. Um, you lost, you know, you've lost, you know, if a surfer wants to get fit, an aging surfer like me wants to stay in Nick. So they do the research, but then it involves a bunch of changes. So you, you need to be systematic about it. You need to start small with the low hanging fruit, just like what we did. Um, 
what what are the things and you need to set up there's a thing called choice architecture where you create your environment for change so the research shows if you pack your bag for the gym and leave it at the bottom of your bed you're more likely to go to the gym the next morning. Right. Remove it, removing resistance, right? Removing yeah. excuses. And yeah, so that's called behavioral activation. <clears throat> and so I think that my, my advice to anyone wanting to change this situation is to find out, start with the end in mind. What do you realistically want to happen? And then go back from there and start really small and learn a model and i'm just trying to think there's a couple of brothers at um stanford and i've just forgotten their names but the book is called how to change when change is hard um and they're brothers and i just can't remember uh their names okay we'll put it in the show notes i'll look it up yeah they're stanford uh neuropsychologists or okay. psychologists and um i can send it to you i'll find it if you like but but that's a really good book on on what to do if you are here here and you want to move to another place. Um, and there's all sorts of deep psychological reasons why people don't change, and so some people need that to address those issues. Yeah. Okay. So now with this program, you say you have you know your team going out there and all of that. Are you back to like? Is that part of your teaching brain sort of being ignited again? Because are you training people to go out and do what you've been doing? Um, okay, so I am um, not involved. Like I said, I've pulled back from the day-to-day running of Surfay. Okay. Um, and because I, yeah, like I say, it's better left in the hands. One of our key missions was that Indonesians should help Indonesians, mm-hmm. not a kind of white guy running, coming in on his horse <laughs> and say, well, we know what to do. Um, so um, our organization has uh, around 75, 80 staff now, and they're all Indonesian. The only um, person is uh, half Indonesian and half Dutch that keeps an eye on things. And she's, she's a perfect mix. She's got that kind of Dutch dotting of the eyes and um, the, Indonesian, uh, the Indonesian kind of understanding of the culture. Wow, so my job, really cool. my job now really is just to, I, I kind of kick the tires when I go out to the field, and you know ask the hard questions along with the board members, and make sure that we're staying on track. And my other role is the dancing bear. They call me, so they wind me up and push me out, and um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, just because I I can tell more grueling stories of rats the size of dogs than anyone else. Oh my god! Um, oh god. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I sort of still helping with building relationships. Well, so talk about that side of it. Like, what are the things that? you know, the average surfer that's going out there, the average, you know, person um, is doing or can do to contribute right now? Well, I mean, I think, um, and you're, Jay, you're a perfect example. I mean, you're an artist and you, you asked that question. And you said, you know, maybe I can do some art for them. Um, maybe I can sell some art for them, you know, and, and that's what you've been doing. Um, and so I think people have to look at their lives and just say, what realistically, what can I do and, and can I do it consistently? So I think um, we don't have a role for people who want to come out and build a library or a school. Um, and that, that's not our model because that's doing what the people can and should do for themselves. Yeah. Um, so we're very different like that. But I think you could, we've had all sorts of people. We've had a, we had a 12 year old, I always remember that, who gave, Gave us half of their bar mitzvah uh, oh. money, oh, and wow. uh, yeah, and we've had children literally say, um, "Mum and Dad, we saw that video on Surf Aid and the kids. I don't want any pocket money for a month. Can you give it to Surf Aid?" <laughs> um, and so, amazing. yeah, we've 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 actually had schools raise us. I don't know what the total number would be, but it would be probably getting up to six figures. Um, and so organize yourself, talk to your friends, get passionate, get passionate, get passionate and get persistent and run some fundraisers. Um, and, uh, you know, and get your wealthy uncle on, on the program. 
<laughs> that was actually the way that we were uh, formally introduced to Surf Aid was in 2008. Um, Chelsea and I and a couple of friends uh, organized a fundraiser event. We had about a thousand Zimzala. people. Zimzala. Yeah, yeah, we called it Zimzala. Like a lifetime we, ago. we actually had Paula Fuga from Hawaii come out and perform, and we had an art show and a great example yeah. of you know what you were talking about. Like my currency happens to be artwork. Someone else's might be music or uh, putting up nets to prevent malaria. Then everyone has something different they can contribute, and I think that's an important thing to remember. Uh, everyone has a different contribution as long as you use it. Well, I also would love to hear a little bit about like, you know, since surf is so included in your mission, um, just your involvement within that world. Like I find the surf community to be very like, it's just an amazing community to be a part of. Um, so what is your involvement there now? Are you guys doing events? Have you been like, what is the surf side look like? Uh, yeah, look, you know, as you know, in 2009, um, People after the crisis, financial crisis, people realized a lot of people didn't want to buy a $70 T-shirt in the surf industry really suffered and, um, you know, they're surviving. But um, so uh, we we had a really good relationship with a lot of them and they were very generous when the times were good, but understandably uh, that's dried up. So we had to kind of reinvent ourselves. And what we did uh, was start a thing called the Surf Aid Cup which is a tag team event. And we now run six of these a year, two in America um, and four in Australia, where teams put, raise a bit of money and come along and we get the pros. You know, we've had Tom Carroll and Rocky and um, Tom Curran and, uh, you know, uh, Raster, all of these guys come down and it's their way of giving back. They come down to the beach for a day and, and our surfers get to hang with their heroes. Um, so, yeah, we have one at Malibu, um, at Encinitas, and we have one at Santa Cruz. And this year, the WSL, um, in their great wisdom and generosity, are uh, hosting us at the ranch. Ooh. Yeah, Erin told me about we, that. Yeah, I we got the call about yeah, that, actually. It's unbelievable. I didn't that's know awesome. that was public. She had emailed me, and I was like, holy shit, that that's sounds really so cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, well, we, uh, maybe I just blew it. Maybe it's not public. <laughs> <laughs> we mean uh, psych? I mean, it's like, I feel like it's it's June, right? So it's got to be public soon. Uh, yeah, look, uh, um, you know, I'm always in trouble with Erin, but um, <laughs> we have a, we have a, a laugh. And uh, yeah, it's June the 21st. Have so. you seen it yet, the ranch? Have you seen these pools in person? Have I, I've watched the videos for yeah, sure, but I haven't, uh, I haven't been there. For a lighthearted question that uh, Erin wanted me to ask you. So Erin is your executive director, and, and uh, I was kind of prying her for some, from, for some material I can use with you. <laughs> and she said you have a good story about how you almost killed her in a car and an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So, Erin, yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> Erin, um. <laughs> uh, the truth was that some guy smashed through a light and uh, we were in a car accident together oh, and no. um, I gave her a hard time because she went off to hospital, but I had, we'd just come away from Billabong and we had a Billabong fundraiser to go to a barbecue and a kind of corporate event and we were due there. And um, Why'd she have to go to the hospital? You couldn't fix it? I thought you were yeah, the you know, doctor kid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she was complaining about her neck and I, come on, Aaron. <laughs> Couldn't have just sewed her face up and made you know made a day out of it. Yeah, she she was just wimping out. I thought, but um, but I turned up at this Billabong um, event, and uh, one of their executives said, "Oh, looked at me, and I was pretty shaky. <laughs> I was kind of pale and shaky." Yeah, and I uh, said, "What just happened?" So oh, we just had a car accident, and this big four wheel drive van just smashed into us, and our and uh, our bags went off, and uh, the car was written off. And he went, wow, I wonder what I looked at you. I know what you need. Sit down there. And he bought me this drink. And I just, it was my first Moscow mule I've ever oh, had. Oh, man. And it just did the job. And I, 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 I All don't the while Aaron's in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. I don't drink a lot at all these days. But I, um, I had a Moscow mule last night, interestingly. I don't know why. I must have known oh, I was going to tell that story. Yeah. but. Um, I fell in love with Moscow Mule. So now I now I what can is a make Moscow, a Moscow Moscow Mule? I'm not familiar. A, okay, now I make a keto Moscow Mule. 
Uh, it's uh, it's lime juice, vodka, ginger, Ooh. and some um, mint leaves tonight. Oh. Okay, and, and it's delicious. And it's uh, to be recommended if you've just had a car accident. <laughs> okay, right. so says the doctor from Doctor yeah. Dave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Three out of four doctors recommended Moscow Mule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so uh, so that's that story. And uh, every time I get into a car with Erin driving, you know, I remind her uh, of her inability to see things coming from the right. <laughs> <laughs> How about some uh, some bragging about what SurveyD has accomplished? Can you tell us the some of the impact and and uh, all the great stuff? What's what stands out okay, in your head? So what stands out in the head is our absolute commitment to measuring things and running this as um, from a cost effectiveness point of view. So in Nias, we tracked in just one group of villages. We now have five five different uh, projects in different island groups. So we do uh, Mentua, Nias, Sumbawa, Sumba, and we're starting in Mexico. And that's kind of the big development. Um, but in Nias, just one of our projects, we had 25 kids dying every year in a group of villages. And we had eight women dying in childbirth every year, according to our research. And now we haven't had a woman die for three years. And the mater- the child mortality rate's gone from 25 to 2. Wow. Uh, wow. And a lot of those 2s are accidents, like kids will fall down a, a well and that kind of thing. So not, not a lot we could yeah. do about that. But um, so that, that's, that if, I'm kind of a competitive guy. I can tell you I've looked at the what a very good mother-child program the stats are from Africa and Asia and Cambodia. And, and if you get a 50% drop, you uh, donors are extremely proud and happy with that, and you get money to do it again. But this is a ninety-five percent drop, so um, that that's kind of what happens when you impassion and empower the people to do it themselves, um, and then and then take it over, and and uh, and that's that's what really creates the sustainable thing. So that's kind of a bragging. I'm um, and I'm proud of the fact that we've managed to just stay core. Uh, stay core to our mission and and not be too proud to accept our mistakes and to regroup and relearn. Uh, and and I think if you want to make the world a better place, Surf Aid is one of the very very best places to put your money. It's awesome. Well, I actually want to ask you a like strategic question, just because there seems to be a trend because of a couple charities um, and a couple that I've contributed to and been a part of that. Do these birth the birth kits? It's like the that we did them for Kenya and we've done them for a couple d- and for Haiti, where you do the like there's only like ten items that need to go in there. They're really cheap birth kits. So you send them over to have like a clean home birth, basically. So it seems like that might be against your principles of like doing it differently. This is actually us physically having to send them something that will be used each time. So do you see that as being part of that, a little bit of that flawed system? Like you're not implementing a change, you're actually just providing something? Uh, yes. Okay. I see that I, I see that as a flawed model, I'll have to be honest. No, I want to hear it because I always question it because I'm like, well, what happens when the kits stop arriving? Exactly. And um, also you're, you're sending them a big message that they're, future improvement and quality of life is depending on the outside where someone from the outside giving them something and that's a very dangerous message because because they they take that and they apply that to the other things that are what they want to learn and improve upon and they that paralyzes them yeah they feel like well until they until the outside helpers focus on that for me then i can't do it basically exactly and when you look at the reasons that women die how to how to do a clean birth you just really need to sterilize the knife and make sure your hands are washed repeatedly during the process and your perineum is washed yeah and you need very clean towels um and that's 90 percent um your kits probably do a hundred percent but 90% 90% can be achieved locally. Right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I would, if, if, if I ever got in control of that project, I'd go, uh, uh, we need to turn this around, people. We need to send people out there to create change. 
Yeah. No, I love hearing it. And I think it's a good offering for people to understand the other side of how it can be done. So no, I appreciate that. I appreciate I, your honesty. I do actually think there is an exception in, in that, um, you know, if it's a basic public health measure that can be sustained, um, then I think there is a role for giving things. Like right now, so for example, um, the mosquito nets, the local government and now does actually uh, provide, and I think that's an example, and maybe your kits, if the local government could, um, and that might be the problem in Haiti, but if it's a true sustainable public health measure, then that I think is an exception for giving things out. But it has yeah. to be part of a wider model. Right. No, I think that's really interesting. Dave, on the surf side of things, so you're obviously you're still a very stoked and active surfer. You've had some like you must have had some incredible experiences going from uh, a corporate type of a doctor to meeting probably some of your surf legend hero friends over the years. Have, do you have any particular stories that stand out like holy crap moments of of surfing next to you know Kelly or Aki or any of these people that uh, are, I know are very involved with surf aid? Um, I think the the you know, we had did this thing called the Wave of Compassion, where some surfers, Tom Carroll and Raster, and uh, a few others came with us. And we actually went up to stay a night with a shaman, which which blew them away. But um, this was post tsunami, and uh, the all the sort of surf companies sponsored them to come out. And I remember surfing um, a wave with Rasta. And I really had no idea. I was poor. It was, it's uh, a very challenging wave, and uh, on my back end, and very gnarly. And um, just being literally beside him and watching him in a barrel and watching him surf this wave was extraordinary. I mean, I've never witnessed anything like it. To to see the the fluidity and the movement and the the adjustment. The min, min, minuscule adjustment of what a really good surfer does compared to my plod plod um, <laughs> <laughs> um, was uh, was really extraordinary, and it, 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 I always remember that. Yeah, yeah. There's like such an intuitive like beauty with people that n- so fluently know that. There's. Have you read that book, The Rise of Superman, by Stephen Cutler? Yes, I know Stephen Cutler. I um, don't know him personally, but we have had a few emails exchanges. But um, yeah, it's a great book, isn't it? Yeah, really fascinating topic on how like these little micro adjustments, like you were talking, happen almost like effort, like completely effortlessly when you're in the in the flow. Have have these guys given you tips, and you're just like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, I assume this is all normal right now, but I would imagine at the beginning of all this, when you started surfing with some heroes and very talented. Yeah, Waterman, that you must have just been completely out of your mind stoked. Oh, absolutely. So um, Brad Gurlock came around to my place the other day. He's been a really great supporter of ours, and uh, and he's very interested in uh, functional medicine and anti aging. That's what I do at the moment. And um, and uh, so we were exchanging tips. I was telling him the latest about intermittent fasting and things like that, and he. Uh, he, he said, so how can I help you? I said, well, my pop, my pop-up sucks. And so uh, <laughs> so as you get older, you know, your hip flexors get really stiff and you, it takes me a couple of seconds to get to my feet. I'm pretty good once I get up. Well, in big waves, I, I'm a big guy, so I prefer the big waves. But, um, but so, yeah, he was helping me with my pop-up. He's going to send me a video of how to do it. And I, yeah, sure enough, I was doing it all wrong. In exchange for <laughs> some longevity tips? Yeah, we got a we've got a contra deal going on. And what's what's your uh, protocol? What are you, are you like doing the keto thing? Or are you doing metformin? Like, what's your uh, what's your thing right now? Yeah, look, um, when you say right now, it's really a, a thing that gathers over time. But um, we're actually reversing Alzheimer's in clients for the first time. So, uh, working with a professor in San Francisco, and we've just published a hundred cases of reversal. So. We're, um, which is pretty extraordinary, but we're, we're focused on the brain um, and the aging of the brain, but, but most of these things apply. So one of the things is the fasting mimicking diet. I would, yeah, Dr. Longo. Yeah, Volta Longo. Yeah. I've had chats with uh, 
so he's doing research right now and, and, and on Alzheimer's, but also on there's there's fifty studies going on right now on cancer and other things. So I think that's pretty extraordinary science that we can eat certain nutrient combinations over a five day period and get a massive release of stem cells. Um, so I've done that three times. I'm meant to be doing it now, but um, I, I, yeah, my nephew came over and I blew it, so I have to re, re, <laughs> restart that. I read his book. I'm trying to convince Chelsea to do that. It's like seems extreme, but from reading the book, it just makes you want to really uh, give it a go because I know it really helps with like autophagy and it's supposed to be like pretty miraculous. Is this what's this doctor in San Francisco's name? Professor Dale Bredesen. Bredesen, yes. We have a center opening up here based on him. That's where we have a friend right. that works oh, yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I work with Dale um, to bring those protocols to Australia and New Zealand. That's really, really cool. Yeah, we're having a, we're having really cra- crazy success. I just talked to a client yesterday, and he's reversed in three months. Wow. Um, and he's young and he's keen and he's doing it really well. So uh, he's actually got uh, sensitivity to mold. Um, okay. And so if you get those people quickly, they can respond well. So do you find, I know this is a complete tangent on the topic of our uh, interview, but do you, <laughs> have you found that the, uh, the, fa- the five-day fasting mimicking diet is extremely different than just doing like a water-only fast? Yeah, it's much easier. Yeah. Um, I've done a seven-day water fast and a four-day one, and that's tough, man. I'd, I'd be lying in bed day five going, they told me it was easy after <laughs> three. And it goes, oh, it's, oh, oh, oh. You know, I'll be just feeling lousy and uh, no energy. But with the fasting mimicking diet, you know, you can be functional. You can be up. You just do a, kind of do a bit of yoga. You can't really get into a whole lot of exercise. But, um, but you can still move around and be functional. And, and yeah, you get hungry a bit. But um, I think, you know, 50,000 years ago, all of us were hungry most of the time. Yeah. Um, and our biology is the same as more or less as a few changes, but uh, as it was. So we're geared up for this. When you fast, all sorts of resilient biological pathways, um, you know, start to turn on. And um, so it's a very powerful thing. And I think the tips for for the fasting diet is to detox ahead because if you if you're really toxic with whatever it is, whether it's heavy metals or chemicals or alcohol, or, um, you're going to feel really loud. You, well, you may not, but you increase your chances of feeling lousy through that fasting period. So, And the second thing is build up through, uh, through time-restricted eating. So, so start skipping, you know, building up breakfast and letting that autophagy start so your system gets used to and the enzymes that you need to burn the fat to keep you fueled, um, those are kicking in and they're primed. Don't just like, okay, I'm doing it tomorrow. Um, you could give it a try, but you might find it kind of tough. I'm hearing like a, um, almost, I'm seeing almost like a pattern repeat, like from your, how you were describing uh, how Surfade was born from a curiosity and a passion and you couldn't help but create something is there uh some some other formation of like brain aid that you're looking to create now that you have this uh newly formed passion for like longevity and whatnot are you going to do something with this beyond your patients and yourself oh god i was just discussing that with a uh, friend who's a pr consultant and uh he was just giving me some advice about what to do and he said you're gonna start a non-profit i get no <laughs> I'm okay. not start- no, I'm not starting another nonprofit. <laughs> that that being said, I am working with a guy who's just started uh, starting a, a um, another a nonprofit called uh, Beating Alzheimer's. And yes, there's always an element of pro bono, give back. Um, we, you know, but this is um, as someone s- said to me: Surfaid filled up your heart, but emptied out your wallet. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm not in a position to start, uh, starting a non-profit again. This is a, um, it's a package. We do 12 month programs. It's not cheap, unfortunately, because people need to pay for their own tests and supplements. It's not government subsidized, right. it's not covered by insurance. So, uh, yes, I'll be giving back, but I don't, uh, it's still going to be a, 
a business. At the end of the day. There's no brain aid coming. <laughs> there's no brain aid coming. Not uh, from me. Dave. Not, not from me. People are no. going to die too early because of you, man. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I think the best thing we can do, what I am committed to, and this is pro bono so far, we've invested thousands of dollars of time and travel. We are trying to get the research up and running. So we've got, um, hundreds of cases now. Dale's got hundreds, and now we just published a hundred cases proving that other committed practitioners can get the same results. But what we need is a random controlled trial, and that's really problematic in modern medicine because there's no drugs involved in these protocols. Right. Um, we want there to be a drug that actually works, but there isn't. Uh, but so. What about like, gonna, met, uh, like metformin or what's it, rapamycin, I believe is another one? Yeah, rapamycin, metformin. I don't take any of those, um, uh, but people could check out spermidine as an alternative to rapamycin. Um, spermidine, and, uh, that sounds kind of creepy. Yeah, it's in sperm <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's in blue cheese. So um, I was listening to a professor of uh, uh, medicine and gerontology. He, he has one meal a day. And, uh, of course, he has one glass of red wine and a whole bunch of blue cheese, and that's his formula. Um, <laughs> so, of course, he's French. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> so, so there's probably some sperm in the mix, too, uh, then. Well, hey blue cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so, so I spend 10, 20 hours a week getting my head around the latest research. But metformin looks promising. Um, it does have some, some downside. And if you're going to do it, I would suggest you do it intermittently okay. um, and just pulse it and perhaps the same with rapamycin. But um, I, I think it's not going to give you the same kind of benefit as you can't supplement your way to longevity. Right. So you're doing a pescatarian or a vegan diet currently? Yeah, I like the pescatarian type of diet. I do eat a little bit of meat because uh, when I lived in Indonesia, I got addicted to rendang. If anyone knows what rendang is, it's uh, beef slowly cooked in coconut and spices for about six hours. And if you like beef, you taste this, you're never going back. Um, so you, you'll, you'll be hooked. So I eat a bit of meat, but it's all, you know, the good stuff. Um, and, but uh, I can't say I'm an extremist and I can't say that um, um, I've got a perfect uh, implementation of my anti-aging model <laughs> but um yeah but i think that's like the thing people need to hear is that like you can make efforts towards this without having to be like all in sometimes yeah you don't have to i mean you've got to have quality of life and you've got to kind of not take everything too seriously um and so but but i do recommend the uh, time restricted feeding for the autophagy so people you know that's a real big low-hanging fruit um, and certainly, you know, don't eat sugar and don't eat processed foods. Those yeah. are big things. Get some exercise. Meditate is a big one. Mm -hmm. Get some sleep. Just do those basics. Um, do them well. You know, what's really interesting is that they say there's like nothing harder to change with people than their food. It's like so personal and psychological and all of that. And it seems like the same way that you kind of chose to re-educate an entire village, you're taking this on within our society and that's like not an easy education to spin um in modern even you know our cultures no no we've definitely taken a few steps wrong uh with the introduction of processed food and our lifestyle and not getting enough sleep you know stress and the, the longest living cultures in the world are the ones that are still living you know close-knit communities walking all day and active eating good healthy food um, and so just the science is all in as far as that's concerned. Yes, we need to learn more, but get yourself a basic whole food diet, do some exercise, get some sleep, meditate, have good relationships. Don't take, have a laugh and, uh, you're going to do well. And awesome. Sleep under a malaria net. Yeah. And keep your malaria net close by. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah. have one question back on our, our, our previous topic really quick. Um, I wanted to ask if you had unlimited funding for SurfAid, what's the project you would implement? I've often wondered when the billionaire would turn up and go, hey, Dave, how much do you need to get the job done? <laughs> and, uh, and it's never happened and probably won't. But um, 
what we what we, what I think we need to do is to educate, uh, challenge, research, and educate the a uh, uh, family, if you like, um, to start to take on more of this hands up model rather than a hand up model, yeah. and and prove to them and to their donors, to the government donors, the big guys, that they've really got to embrace this model uh, with, a, with a, both a passion and a discipline. Um, and so I, I would be very, if we had lots of money, I would be getting into research, doing more research on, on our programs, taking on more programs, but having external auditors prove that this is the way to go and then spend money, invest money on influencing others because that's, that's, we're going to have the biggest impact. I mean, if you successfully change or tweak or improve the model of some of these very large agencies, yeah. um, you're going to have a huge impact. Yeah, it sounds to me like you're seeing that they have this reach and if you could just educate them on how to do it better and more efficiently, it would make a really big difference. Yes. I mean, that being said, a lot of them are doing a lot of good things. I don't want to. Well, not that they're not doing good things. It's just sometimes there's more efficient ways. That's all, right? Yeah, and I think it's all about focusing on the science and and looking at what really does make a big difference and then working out how to implement that in each individual culture. Are there uh, political or religious or cultural obstacles or threats or anything of lo- along those lines that have been a problem or... Uh, you know. there's, there's always all of the above yeah <laughs> um yeah there's always obstacles and uh, well we you know we, we don't call them obstacles we call them challenges mm-hmm. yes of course <laughs> <laughs> thank you for challenging me local mobster yeah. yeah we and that and that happens because when you when you start working in a village you stay you change power dynamic yeah and power dynamic moves down to the women and the children and the families and the men that want to make a difference to their lives. And we have had problems with religious leaders and uh, ex, you know, chiefs of villages who, who don't like what, what's happening. Um, and so that's always a challenge. Uh, that being said, one of the great thing, models I really love about, uh, thing about our model is we Compared to other models where people are in and out, a six-month program or one year or three, we make long-term commitments to areas if we can. So I was in Nias uh, quite a while ago, and we were sitting in front of the governor. And, you know, unless we get his signed approval, we're dead in the water. We can't do anything in Nias. So we were there explaining the things we were doing, and he was just tuned out. It was hot. He was sitting in his big chair, and he could just see that, oh, he wasn't involved. And then I literally saw him change and sit forward. He went, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't you the surfer? Aren't you the guys that helped us during the tsunami in 2005? And you were the only agency that helped out our, all those island groups of ours that no one. Yeah, that's us. And then he sat forward and he said, now, what is it you want? Mm-hmm. And he said, we want you. This was like 10 years later. We want you to provide more money for the midwives that we've trained so that we can get professional midwives to deliver the babies, not these uh, traditional birth loads. And, and he said, you're the only agency that's still here. And yes, I will give you what you wow. want. Sounds like a good, good idea. Yeah, so staying long term, you build trusting relationships with the government and with the law, and, and, and you get them to start to invest in their own program. And yes, the government there knows the results because we've shared it with them of our program. And these are in some of their most remote, impoverished villages that they've kind of given up on. I said, no, this model works in those villages. And so now they have invested big time in supporting the program and keeping it sustained. Got it. That's it's God. It's really fascinating. All the different facets of it, uh, having to deal with things that shouldn't even be part of your mission. You still have to um, kind of take them all into account. Is there anything else you want to tell us about the mission? We've like absolutely loved every angle of this conversation. I uh, know. I think we've we've got to the core of it. Um, I just encourage people to you know follow their passion, especially if it's a value based 
passion and um, and believe you can do it. Have you maintained um, personal friendships, relationships, or kept in touch with some of the early people that you helped and saved? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I'm not out there as often as I'd like, um, but there are certain villages I go in and there's some kids I go and see how they're doing, um, especially at Kadiat where H is. Uh, I've got a picture of him up on the wall. Um, there's a little kid who was, you know, really suffering, um, and I thought would die who, who we helped pull through. So yeah, there's a couple of those. Are any of them working in the program now? No, but we do, we have recruited quite a few, um, because we use volunteers, so the villagers create these, uh, volunteers and so health volunteers. So the people in that we call them early adopters and natural leaders. And so when we see them, people are clearly talented at mobilizing and they're liked by the community. Sometimes or quite often we'll offer them a job and sometimes, you know, they're, they're coconut farmers and they can't read and write. And so we've got some of our best, best staff are those people who, who we've helped to learn to read and write and, and to, you know, do things like that. So, yeah, it's definitely a bottom-up process. That's really cool. So um, in closing, I always ask everyone one question, and we didn't talk a lot about your childhood and all of that, which I usually get out of people, but we had too many other things to talk about. Um, But the question is, if I had to drop you back in your childhood kitchen, what is the first thing you think of? Back in my childhood kitchen? Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as food, what's the first food I think of? Anything. Anything in the kitchen. Oh, I, okay. So, uh, um, what comes to mind is is making shortbread with my mother, um, and uh, she would always leave me the bowl um, to lick. Oh, that's what my <laughs> kids are going to remember. <laughs> that magic so this, bowl. <laughs> this delicious, terribly unhealthy mix of uh, uh, flour, butter, and sugar. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah, and so that that comes to one of my favorite moments would be on the stool. I can see it now because um, I would have been, you know, six or seven, um, looking, mum, waiting for mum to give me the bowl. Uh, she'd rolled out the shortbread and put them in the oven. And where was that? Where did you grow up, Dave? Uh, I grew up in New Zealand, Wellington, uh, New Zealand. I've heard that's incredible. We've been to Australia, but never to New Zealand, yeah, and I've never never heard over. a bad thing about it. No, it's a funny place. It's definitely, you know, they call it, that's the country that God created at the end. Um, and what he learned to get it right. And uh, and I was in a Thai customs queue waiting to come into Thailand and two couples of Canadians started talking to each other. And they went, oh, wow, we've just been to New Zealand and we went to Australia and uh, well, we love New Zealand. It's much better. <laughs> and the people are so friendly. And they don't even care what they wear. And, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I looked down. I looked down. And I had a grubby pair of thongs and a holy jeans. Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's about that right. Kind of sums, <laughs> sums us up. <laughs> oh man! Oh that's my gosh! Awesome. So this is amazing. So I guess our last question is just where can everyone find um, you specifically if you have any type of contact email and then um, the website. So um, the website's www.surfa.org, and my email's drdave, D-R-D-A-V-E, at surfaidinternational.org. For some reason, I didn't, they didn't give me the new email. Um, which, which, <laughs> You're not which important enough, been, huh? <laughs> no, it would have been easier to type out for everybody. So, <laughs> That's uh, fine. We'll throw it in the but, show notes. It's perfect. Fair enough. Thank yeah. you, Dave. It's It's uh, been a complete honor to be an ambassador to SurfAid for now what's going on 11 years. And uh, to have this chance to hear your story and chat with you has been just Really great. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. So, Chels, what would you think of that? It was awesome. I think it was cool to finally understand a charity a little bit better that we've been supporting for so long. Yeah, like, it's it's been a wild ride. Uh, 11 years now, almost. Um, yeah, but I mean, I just, I don't think I really understood. It was like one man and like this individual trip that it was all based off of. And it was cool bridging the gap i think it's hard to explain to people in person when you're trying to understand why it's like a surf charity and understanding that it's all rooted in that was pretty cool for me yeah i had heard like uh i'd heard dr dave mention like over the years 
and he was kind of like this mysterious figure. And then to finally chat with him, he was just so like funny and just down to earth. And it was cool to see how he saw an opportunity to change the world. And I don't think he had any clue what he was getting into from his own admission. He just saw that, hey, I'm a doctor. Here's something I could do. And then it kind of blossomed into this huge organization. Yeah, like in a cool way, it was almost just like he, he he's just so goal-oriented. He just like couldn't not do it. It's cool to see. I think that's a great example for people like when you're um you're living your life and if you are I don't know if you're an expert or a specialist or have information or an ability and you have an opportunity to do something I think Dave said a great example it all takes us one step at a time. Yes, absolutely. Um Speaking of one step at a time, we just yeah, had our little daughter little walk in the room. Hi Summer. Visitor. Hi. You want to say like hi? chatting on our podcast. Oh, you got a boo boo. Are you okay, honey? Okay, I'll get you a band-aid, okay? So, yeah, I mean, I felt like it was also just, the, mo- the of course, the mommy, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the mother-baby thing was always, like, a big part for me, just to see there are so many cultures that we don't understand these, these rates of death in um, women, including our own country, I might add, um, in, for maternal health. It was really fascinating to listen to, like, how to integrate change in a culture like that, and very relatable for me when I'm working in a world where People think like hiring a doula is such a privilege when really it should be a necessity and understanding how like just integrating and being a part of something can change from the inside out. It was really cool to see. We're we're in such a medically based society and it was really interesting for us to talk about how it was it was the education and the malaria nets that really were the key, not actually just dropping in parachutes of medicine. I think that's a great parallel to what you were just talking about with like the birthing world, like education and guiding people as opposed to just sticking women in a hospital, running them through a protocol. Yes. Well, I would question that because I think Dave, Dr. Dave actually said that education was the problem is that we always think we can come in and educate when actually it is like remolding how we believe things are functioning within our own society. Like bringing the white man in to educate was not working. I think it was for me, I took that it was about education, but doing it in a way that spoke to their language, like using creative. Why did I just pronounce that so weird? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm really working on my pronunciation, and sometimes it ends up me saying creative. <laughs> I'm trying to like lose my Jersey accent a little bit. That's a funny word for you to lose track of creative. in this podcast, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of education, it's never too late, folks, to yes. speak <laughs> oh, better. But anyway, yes. I mean, the whole thing was really fascinating. And of course, like we love jumping into the Alzheimer's bit because we have a really big center being built here, which I did, you know, do our own little research after we ended this. And it is through Dr. Dale Bredesen. So we actually have that same thing that he's working on in Australia coming into Jersey um, with our very own Michelle Bruno working there, who is a little local, local friend. Little local love. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool to go off on that tangent about longevity, because as you know, I've been kind of like a freak since I've read that book. I did a little experimenting with the keto thing. Is that the book that made you a freak? Is that what we're Well, I've probably been a a freak long before that. (laughs) That probably upped my freak game a little bit. I did like the, I'm very extreme, as you're well aware. And I did that keto thing for a month. But then reading Dr. Longo's book was just really eye-opening on how powerful the fasting mimicking diet is. So I was, I was really pleasantly surprised to uh, go off on that little tangent. Yeah. I almost thought that was like a whole nother um, podcast. Like we were kind of like, Oh, we could actually keep going. Yeah. So maybe, you know, we'll get, we'll work on Bredesen. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I've, you know, like we both talked about many times, we were, we've been involved with the charity for a long time. I think we didn't mention, I think having the, the word surf in the charity probably helps them quite a bit marketing wise because it's like oh surf i want to get involved with it but in actuality it's just it's a great little gateway to get sucked into the charity and then once you realize that they are helping people in such a uniquely um creative way uh i think that was really cool yeah well i actually feel like i mean it's interesting because it surf might actually turn people away and on understanding what they actually do just yeah, because you're just like full of contradictions on I'm this just, little outro. You know, I'm pulling a Jay Alders <laughs> and taking the. Uh... Oh, is that what it's like <laughs> talking to me? That's yep. so freaking annoying. Yeah, there you, <laughs> there you have it. I'm like the king of devil's advocate <laughs> on everything. I, like I, I could be like, don't you think the sky is like blue with white clouds? And he'd be like, hmm, is that really what you think? 
That's interesting. I got to work on that. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe I just have to accept myself that that's part of me. <laughs> the freakish side of me. To uh, um, re educate anyway, myself. Yes. But anyway, this was a great episode. Absolutely. It was great to get to know Dave. He's an interesting, charismatic character. I hope to uh, surf with him one day and maybe uh, camp under a malaria net and eat I don't vegan do food. That. I would like to do that. Camp under a malaria What net. if it's at the surf ranch? I don't think I'd camp under a, a malaria <laughs> net. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll surf with him and-, and I'm into that. We'll fast, surf ranch would be a great maybe idea. Maybe we'll skip lunch and just fast together. <laughs> there you go. Now and, we're talking. And we'll live a really, really long time together. How about yes, that? Sounds good. All right, guys. We hope you loved it. Tune in next week for another great episode of Shifting Perceptions. Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, if you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast which is the same as our website, shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. We look and reply to all comments, so please share with your friends, tag us. We appreciate all the love. And don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments, so I'm sure if you want to just have a space you can reach out, these are the places to do it. Um, we also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudiollc.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.